The much-anticipated Russian Grand Offensive has probably begun. Russia has been putting pressure on the Ukrainian defenders on the North Luhansk front, around Volodar, and different sections of the Donbass front, while continuing to grind through the Ukrainian defenses around Bakhmut. This seems like a make-or-break moment for the Russian army in Ukraine, as if they fail to gain anything meaningful from this offensive, they will lose the initiative to Ukraine, which is preparing for its own offensive sometime in spring. Welcome to our video on the updates from the Russian invasion of Ukraine from the first half of February. There have also been worldwide changes, reaching far beyond Ukraine's borders and into our own lives. Russia further cut its oil output just days ago, and now 75 million people face losing power. Energy bills already took twice as much money out of your pocket last year and put roughly one in six people behind on their payments. And now a stunning survey shows over half of Americans making six figures are living paycheck to paycheck. Even Goldman Sachs is honest about where the market is headed, nowhere. It's why major institutions are pouring hundreds of millions into low correlation assets, like one that's available to more people than ever thanks to the revolutionary approach of our sponsor, Masterworks. They specialize in art investing, a particularly stable market in the current climate. In fact, last year, art market prices outpaced 94% of the stocks in the S&P 500. Masterworks makes getting into art easy, allowing people to invest without the usual massive entry costs. And they've built a track record of 11 exits, with the last three handing back 10, 13 and 35% net returns, paying out over 35 million to date to users including Kings and Generals viewers like you. Masterworks has seen over 650,000 users try to gain access, and there is a waitlist, but right now you can get VIP access to their latest offerings. Just check the description below. As usual, let's first look at the developments on the battlefield. In this period, there has been heavy action on all fronts but the Hassan front. On the Zaporizhian front, Russia continued stubbornly sending its 40th and 155th Naval Infantry Brigades on frontal assaults on Volodar, leading to horrible losses on their side. The 72nd Mechanized Brigade and the 68th Jaeger Brigade have fire control over the road leading to Volodar from Pavlivka and Mikilska, allowing the Ukrainian artillery to have easy targets. According to a Ukrainian military official, Ukraine destroyed 136 Russian vehicles, including 36 tanks, within a week. Footage confirmed that the Russians lost around 100 tanks and armored vehicles. But the Ukrainian sources report that Russia is bringing reinforcements to the Zaporizhia front, including the Greater Mariupol area, which currently hosts around 30,000 Russian soldiers. So we may speculate that Russia will continue targeting Volodar. After months of defending its lines along the P07 and P66 highways on the North Luhansk front, Russia has finally launched its own attack here. The Russians have been amassing reinforcements in this area, and are currently pushing to advance on Liman, Kupiansk, Bilohorivka and other areas. On the northern section of this front, elements of the 4th Guards Tank Division and the 61st Naval Infantry Brigade reportedly pushed back the Ukrainian 67th Mechanized Brigade to capture Dverichna on February 4th. In the nevska makivka section, the 144th Motor Rifle Division and the 76th Guards Air Assault Division have made some progress around Makivka at the beginning of the month. The Russian sources claim that the same units have gained ground towards Terny and Yampolivka. Around the same time, other elements of the 76th Guards Air Assault Division Bar's infantry battalions and regular Russian units push back the Ukrainian 95th Air Assault Brigade in the forest area around Krimina. Bilohorivka was also under intense pressure from the LPR 2nd Army Corps and Bar's battalions in this period. But despite Russian claims, this town is still under Ukrainian control. So far, Ukrainian defenses are holding their ground, but the Russian offensive on the North Luhansk front has not yet reached its culmination. They still have more forces in reserve, and will look to advance on Kupiansk to the north to push the Ukrainians to the west bank of the Oskil River, and on a line between Makivka and Bilohorivka to threaten the Ukrainian control over important areas like Liman and Seversk. But the Donbass front remains the main focus of the Russian army. Following the capture of Solodar in January, the Russian army, spearheaded by Wagner mercenaries, continued expanding its area of control around Solodar. 
On February 1st, the Wagner units occupied the minuscule village of Sako Ivant City. The following day, they captured Mikolaevka, but their advance north of the T0513 highway was somewhat stalled in the areas around Rodolivka and Fedorivka by the 10th Separate Mountain Assault Brigade and its 109th Battalion. South of Solodar, on February 12th, Wagner announced the capture of Krasnohora, coming ever closer to reaching the junction of the T0513 and M03 highways. The last hurdle for them is Paraskovivka. If they managed to capture it, they would completely cut the supply line to Bakhmut through the MO3 highway, which is currently under Russian fire control. There is also a risk of encirclement of Ukrainian units defending Paraskovivka, including the 30th Mechanized Brigade and a pro-Ukrainian Chechen battalion, if the Russians capture the section of the MO3 highway west of Paraskovivka. West of Bakhmut, the 60th and 63rd Mechanized Brigades have successfully prevented Wagner from capturing Ivanivska and taking the T0504 highway, the last remaining relatively safe supply line to Bakhmut under control. On February 14th, they even managed to push Wagner away from the highway. Heavy fighting is also ongoing in Bakhmut, where Wagner is making incremental advances. But Bakhmut is still under Ukrainian control, which Prigozhin confirmed. Bakhmut will not be taken soon. Heavy fighting is also happening in Marienka and the Avdivka section, but there have not been any significant changes in this period. For now, Ukraine is standing its ground in Bakhmut, and from the looks of it, they have chosen to bleed out Wagner and other units fighting in the city to complicate any further Russian advance on the Donbass front. Ukraine will fight in Bakhmut until their encirclement becomes imminent. Wagner has succeeded in advancing on the Donbass front, but their tactics are extremely costly for their manpower. In a video posted on February 16th, a Wagner medic says that the mercenaries are losing hundreds of men every day. According to a Russian source, Wagner sends its assault groups of eight to the contact line to reveal Ukrainian positions, no matter the cost. Usually it causes significant losses, but according to this source and many others, refusal to follow orders leads to an execution in Wagner units. If this assault group fails, another one is sent until the position is secured. Then an assault group, which has managed to dig in, sends coordinates of the Ukrainian position to its artillery. This is followed by artillery shelling of this position for several hours, after which another assault group joins with the previous group, which manages to dig in. Wagner usually prepares four assault waves on the same position, but according to this source, it took 14 waves to secure a position in one section of Solidar. This tactic has been working for Wagner so far, but it has caused big casualties among inmates recruited by Prigozhin, who are usually sent as attack waves. We will see if this tactic can be sustained by Wagner for long, especially given that Wagner no longer recruits from prisons, according to Prigozhin. Whether that is due to the unwillingness of inmates to join Wagner due to high casualties, or the decision of the Kremlin, we do not know. But if we take into consideration the leaked media guidelines of the Russian Ministry of Defense, which demands media outlets not to mention Prigozhin or Wagner, we can assume that Prigozhin is currently losing the political battle to Shoigu. It has also been claimed that the Russian Ministry of Defense plans to integrate the DPR and LPR forces, volunteer battalions, and other units fighting in Ukraine into its structure, arguably to have a higher degree of control over them. Finally, the claim of Ukrainian military intelligence that Gazprom is creating its own mercenary group, and rumors that now the Ministry of Defense is recruiting prisoners with military experience to the army, may indicate that the Russian government is looking for an alternative to Wagner. A video where Wagner soldiers ask the Ministry of Defense for artillery shells demonstrates that their situation is not the greatest. What are the Russian goals on the battlefield at this point? We've dedicated an entire video to this subject already, so we'll not do a deep dive into it. To summarize, Russia will try to proceed with the Donbass front as its primary objective. They intend to capture Kramatorsk and Slovyansk. They will also actively seek to occupy Kupiansk, Liman, Bilohorivka, and other essential areas in the northern Donbass, and probe Ukrainian defenses there and in sections like Volodar on the Zaporizhian front to find an opening in the Ukrainian defense. At this point, another attack on Kyiv seems unlikely for the reasons we discussed in previous videos. 
The statement of the President of Belarus, Lukashenko, corroborated this. On February 16th, he stated that Belarus would enter the war only if there were aggression against it, and to quote, if even one soldier sets foot in Belarus to kill my people. But could Kharkiv re-emerge as a target of the Kremlin? Some indicators are pointing to that. It has been reported that Russia has re-established its military camps in Voronezh and Kursk Oblasts, in the exact locations where Russian units were stationed on the eve of the war. Both Kursk and Voronezh are relatively close to Kharkiv, and can once again be used as staging points for an attack on the second largest city of Ukraine. Furthermore, the head of the Russian-appointed Occupation Administration of Kharkiv Oblast, Vitaly Ganchev, claimed that Russia intends to recapture the areas of Kharkiv Oblast they lost earlier during the Ukrainian Izium counteroffensive. It is worth monitoring whether the Russians plan another attempt on Kharkiv in the foreseeable future, or on Sumy. According to Ukrainian sources, the Russian army has gathered more than 10,000 soldiers on the Russian border near Sumy and has erected a field hospital there, which may indicate that the Russians are planning an offensive action on Sumy. For now, Ukraine is defending. It would have to withstand the Russian pressure on three fronts before the Western armored support arrives and can help Ukraine launch its counter-offensive sometime in spring or summer. Ukraine is currently recruiting its citizens to the Assault Guard, which will consist of assault brigades in the upcoming battles to liberate Crimea, Luhansk and Donetsk. According to Ukrainian officials, 17,000 Ukrainians have already signed up. But Ukraine still needs all the support it can get to launch a successful counter-offensive. Several notable developments have been related to military and economic support provided and pledged to Ukraine by its Western allies. On February 1st, Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu said they could consider providing military aid, including the Iron Dome air defense system. Japan promised $170 million for emergency reconstruction work in Ukraine. On February 2nd, the EU delivered 500 million euros for the reform process in Ukraine and sent 2,400 generators. On February 3rd, the US announced another military aid package, including GLSDB, HIMARS and M982 Excalibur munitions, artillery shells, heavy machine guns, 181 MRAP vehicles, 250 javelins, 2,000 anti-tank rockets, Claymore mines, drones, equipment, radars, generators and so on. Bloomberg reports that the realistic timeline for the arrival of GLSDB in Ukraine is nine months. A few days later, US President Biden reiterated the unwavering American support to Ukraine for as long as they may need it. Also, on February 3rd, Germany approved the delivery of 178 Leopard 1 tanks, and stated its intention to purchase 15 Gepard anti-aircraft guns for Ukraine. On February 4th, US Prosecutor General Merrick Garland approved the transfer of $5.4 million confiscated from the Russian propagandist Konstantin Malafiev to Ukraine. This is the first decision of its kind since the start of the war in Ukraine. On the same day, Portuguese Prime Minister Antonio Costa reiterated that Portugal would send an unspecified number of Leopard 2 tanks to Ukraine. On February 6th, it was reported that Ukraine's Western allies thoroughly examined captured Russian equipment to conclude which components they would need to try to block from entering Russia to create problems for Russian weapon manufacturing. On February 7th, Reuters reported that Switzerland is close to lifting the ban on weapon supply to Ukraine. Also on this day, Denmark pledged to deliver Leopard 1 tanks to Ukraine, while the German Minister of Defense informed that Leopard 2A6 tanks would be given to Ukraine in late March. On February 8th, Zelensky traveled to London. British Prime Minister Sunak stated that Challenger 2 tanks would arrive in Ukraine in March. Zelensky reported that Britain has agreed to provide long-range weapons and armored vehicles. Zelensky also delivered a speech in the House of Commons, calling on Britain for Wings for Freedom, for fighter jets. While the British made no commitments on this matter, one can sense that there is more and more momentum in delivering fighter jets to Ukraine. The British Prime Minister Sunak agreed to expand the program of Ukrainian soldiers to train pilots too. On February 9th, 
Polish Prime Minister Morawiecki stated their readiness to give fighter jets to Ukraine, but added that Poland would not be the first NATO country to take this step. A few days later, the sources of the Financial Times claimed that the White House was considering the possible delivery of fighters to Ukraine. The mood of the Ukrainian Defense Minister Reznikov at the Brussels meeting of the Ukraine Defense Contact Group also indicates the West is getting closer to sending fighters to Ukraine. The US Defense Secretary, Austin, stated at the meeting that the US and its allies would help the Ukrainian army to counterattack in the spring. This includes eight countries – Germany, Poland, Canada, Portugal, Spain, Norway, Denmark and the Netherlands – supplying Leopard tanks to Ukraine, the USA, Poland and Czechia supplying other tanks, while several countries would send air defense. Predictably, Russia reacted angrily to the talks of delivery of fighter jets to Ukraine, as the Russian embassy in Britain warned that delivery of British jets would have military and political consequences for the entire European continent. These threats have been made for the last year, and sound even more hollow each time they are made. The rest of the military aid to Ukraine included 10,000 shells for Grad MLRS from Pakistan, Caesar self-propelled howitzers from Denmark, 20 BMP-1s from Greece, two more Iris T air defense systems from Germany, Archer artillery systems, and more than 50 infantry fighting vehicles from Sweden. Germany is also in talks with Ukraine regarding the delivery of Panther main battle tanks, while Britain plans to launch military vehicle production in Ukraine. The February 9th decision of Musk's SpaceX to ban the satellite connection of Ukrainian drones to Starlink has been the main notable negative development for Ukraine in terms of Western support in this period. It is unclear if this ban is for all Ukrainian drones, or only the ones used to attack deep into Russian territory. There were also several notable reports of foreign military support to Russia in this period. On February 5th, the Wall Street Journal claimed that Iran and Russia plan to build a plant manufacturing Shahed 136 drones. On February 9th, Putin instructed the Agency for Strategic Initiatives to support federal subjects in developing the manufacturing of drones. On February 13th, The Guardian reported that Iran delivered 18 long-range drones, 6 Mahajo-6 drones and 12 Shahed 121 and 129 drones, capable of striking and then returning to its base. Russia will need more drones to continue targeting Ukraine's critical civilian infrastructure. Even though in the last couple of months, Russia has not been employing this tactic too often, there still were several notable drone and missile attacks on Ukraine. On February 2nd, a Russian missile destroyed an apartment building in Kramatorsk, killing at least three people. On February 10th, Russia launched 71 cruise missiles, including KH-101, KH-555, Kaliber and S-300 missiles, on Kyiv, Helmanitsky, Dnipropetrovsk, Vinitsia, Zaporizhia, Odessa, Nikolaev, Poltava, Zhotomir, Kirovahrad and Kharkiv blasts. The government confirmed that two calibers were fired from the Black Sea and passed through Moldovan airspace. A few days later, Zelensky claimed that Russia was planning a coup d'etat to oust the pro-Western government of Moldova. Moldovan intelligence later confirmed this. Overnight, on February 10th to 11th and 15th to 16th, Russia conducted more attacks on Ukrainian infrastructure. The good news for Ukraine is that it seems like they are managing to stabilize the energy situation in the country. On February 12th, the president of the Ukrainian nuclear power structure, Energoatom, Petro Kotin, stated that Ukraine had launched all of its nine nuclear blocks, which would solve the issue of blackouts, at least in Odessa, Kyiv, Helmanitsky, and Zhotomir blasts. Overall, the Russian terror tactic of destroying Ukrainian energy infrastructure seems to have failed to reach its goals. Several noteworthy reports have also appeared regarding the Russian economy and internal affairs. According to the Ministry of Finances, Russia's budget revenues dropped by 35%, while expenditure raised by 59% in the period between January 2022 and January 2023. This shows that sanctions against Russia may not have had an immediate effect, which Ukraine would have wanted, but it still hurts Russia's capacity to wage war. On February 6, Putin signed a decree allowing Russian MPs and regional and municipal deputies 
not to publish their incomes publicly. In contrast, law enforcement agencies in Ukraine continued conducting anti-corruption raids in response to several corruption scandals. Heavy losses are mounting for both sides. On February 3rd, an unnamed senior US official claimed almost 200,000 losses by Russia. On February 10th, the American official Celeste Wallander stated that Russia had likely lost half of its main battle tanks since the start of the war. On February 12th, the UK Ministry of Defence claimed that Russia lost up to 800 soldiers per day in February. To compare, in June and July 2022, the Russian daily losses were fewer than 200 people. There have been no recent credible reports on Ukrainian losses. According to the Oryx blog, the visually confirmed equipment losses for Russia as of February 17th are 1,733 tanks, 3,655 vehicles, 231 command posts and communication stations, 606 artillery pieces and vehicles, 175 multiple rocket launches, 72 aircraft, 77 helicopters, and 192 drones. For Ukraine, these are 461 tanks, 1,337 vehicles, 8 command posts and communication stations, 236 artillery pieces and vehicles, 39 multiple rocket launches, 58 aircraft, 29 helicopters, and 76 drones. More videos on this topic are on the way, so make sure to subscribe and press the bell button to see them. Recently, we've started releasing weekly patron and YouTube member exclusive videos. Join the ranks of patrons and YouTube members via the link in the description or by pressing the button under the video to watch these weekly videos, learn about our schedule, get early access to our videos, join our private Discord, and much more. Please consider liking, commenting, and sharing. It helps immensely. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.